I will present the following three points to show why Jesus did not have two natures. One, the New Testament describes the origin of the Son via procreation. Two, the New Testament describes the death of the Son of God. And three, the so-called two natures of Christ is a post-biblical, in other words, non-biblical doctrine. First, the New Testament writers did not believe a pre-existent, quote, God the Son, second person of a so-called Trinity God, entered Mary's womb in order to take on, assume human flesh or nature. Instead, the New Testament writers describe the origin, Genesis, Matthew 1, verse 1, of Jesus the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. In verse 18, Matthew describes how the origin of Jesus came about. And in verse 20, the angel of the Lord says to Mary that the child begotten, that is procreated in her womb, is from the Holy Spirit. In other words, a miracle by God. Similar language is used by the angel Gabriel in Luke chapter 1 when he says to Mary, You will conceive and give birth to a son. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. For this reason, the child will be the Son of God. The Son's origin, coming into being, into existence, happened here for the very first time, and we all know human beings do not pre-exist their birth. The words of the angel are a fulfillment of famous Old Testament prophecies like Psalm 2 verse 7, where God says in a prophecy, you are my son, today I have begotten you, that is, I have become your father. Psalm 110 verse 3, where the Septuagint, or the Greek translation of the Hebrew scriptures, I have begotten you from the womb before the morning star. John, in his gospel, consistently refers to Jesus as the only begotten, that is, procreated Son of God. This has been the traditional rendering of the Greek compound word monogenes, from the Greek monos, only one, and genes from the Greek yenao. The latter is used throughout the genealogies of both Old and New Testaments to refer to fathers begetting or procreating children. According to Ralph's commentary of Genesis, the word yenao means to cause something to come into existence primarily through procreation. This explains why the son says in John 6 verse 57, as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the living Father. The Apostle Paul believed the same when he says in Galatians 4, verse 4, God sent forth his Son made of a woman. The Greek translated as made is from the verb yinome, which according to Bauer's lexicon means to come into being, existence through the process of birth. Thayer's lexicon, to become, that is, to come into existence, begin to be, receive being. So for Paul, the son comes into being inside, not outside his mother's womb, as the two natures doctrine would have you believe. This is exactly the same as when Matthew and Luke describe the procreation of the son by miracle in the womb of Mary. The IVP Bible background commentary is right to note that what we find in Matthew and Luke is not the story of a divine being, that is, a God the Son, descending to earth in the guise of a man, but rather the story of a miraculous conception without aid of any man, divine or otherwise. Point number two, the Son died. In Romans 5.10, Paul says, once we were God's enemies, but we have been brought back to him because his son has died for us. Romans 8, 32, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. Galatians 2, 20, the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, 
the Son of God died for Paul and by extension for all who believe he is the Messiah of God. Similarly, John 3, 16, 1 John 4, 10 says that God gave his only begotten Son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. Notice, these scriptures say the sacrificial work was done by the Son himself who suffered and eventually died a horrible death as a sacrifice for our sins. The point is there is nothing here to even suggest this happened to some impersonal human nature only, and however you want to define death, the Bible says God simply cannot do it. 1 Timothy 1.17, now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God. And as a matter of historical fact, the idea of a suffering and dying God was first introduced by some of the so-called church fathers as early as the second century AD. Bishop Melito of Sardis believed the God has been murdered, the King of Israel has been put to death by an Israelite right hand. This type of rhetoric inevitably led to the anti-Semitism of other so-called early church fathers and later Protestant reformers. For example, in his sermons, John Calvin repeatedly called the Jews profane, unholy, sacrilegious dogs. And my last point, the so-called two natures doctrine is post-biblical, and some well-known Trinitarians are very critical of this fact that has been ensconced in the creeds of mainstream modern-day Christianity. For example, the noted Scottish minister and scholar John McIntyre was right to say, the scriptures obviously do not think of Jesus Christ in dualistic terms, which in honesty we must admit is one of the first impressions created by the use of the two-nature model. When Luke says, in chapter 2, verse 52, that Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man, Luke does not say that it was in respect of his human nature. Even in the great prayer of John 17, when Jesus makes his awareness of his oneness with the Father unmistakably plain, John 17, 5, John 17, 10, and 21, there's not the slightest hint that one part of his person is speaking or that what he is saying might not be entirely true of his whole person. It was left to later apologetic to invent subtleties, one might even say deceptions of this sort. The Catholic Roman theologian Thomas Hart noted that in Chalcedon and the theological development that flows from it, Jesus is called man in the generic sense, that is human, but not a man. He has a human nature, but is not a human person. The person in him is the second person of the Blessed Trinity. Jesus does not have a human personal center. This is how the council at Chalcedon gets around the possible problem of a split personality. Therefore, adds Hart, the Chalcedonian formula, that is, Jesus is truly God and truly man, makes a genuine humanity impossible. The Protestant historian Bishop A.T. Hansen made the following admission. During my theological formation, I was well instructed in the traditional account of the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ. I distinctly remember being told that the Word of God, when he assumed human nature, assumed impersonal humanity, that Jesus Christ did not possess a human personality that God became man in Jesus Christ, but that he did not become a man. In other words, what these Trinitarian bishops, scholars, and historians are telling you is that the two natures doctrine results in a Jesus who was never even a man, that is, a human person.